I'd like to share with you three stories about my professional life. These are three episodes, um, a bit of failure in each one of them, and out of these failures and out of my corrections of these failures, uh, I have discovered the, I call it the three foundational principles uh, in the work that we have done with Combi and in my own personal work in developing the, the Combi method. Um, first, I want to take you back to my, to my doctoral work. I, I finished a PhD in communication at the University of Michigan many, many years ago. I won't tell you how many years ago. Um, and part of that PhD, about half of it was in marketing communication in the School of Business Administration at the University of Michigan. So I, I have this wonderful PhD and I'm returning to my home country in the Caribbean. Uh, first, I was going to Trinidad and Tobago, but I was quite happy to work anywhere in the Caribbean. So I'm thinking with my PhD in communication, with my specialization in broadcasting and journalism and all of that, that I would end up working in the media. Unfortunately, and on the other hand, fortunately, I didn't end up working in the media. My first job um, after my PhD was in the area of agricultural extension. Had nothing to do with marketing communication. Of course, agricultural extension has a bit to do with communication, um, but it has to do with agriculture, and I've never done any work in agriculture. I've never grown anything in my life. And the area of agriculture that I was hired to work in was in the area of banana cultivation. Now, I eat a lot of bananas, but I've never grown bananas in my life either. And th the challenge that um, I was presented with was the following. Uh, there are four islands in the Caribbean where all of our bananas uh, that are produced, uh, there was an agreement that they will be shipped to the UK. We had a, a, a firm closed market with the United Kingdom and all, our, all of our bananas will end up in the British market, in the London supermarkets. And uh, uh, the Caribbean governments uh, um, in the, what we call the Windward Islands, where most of the bananas were produced, were getting complaints from the United Kingdom. The complaints were coming from British housewives. And the complaints, was, uh, the complaints were they didn't like our bananas anymore. Why? The reason is the bananas had black dots on them when they went into the supermarkets looking for quality bananas. And the British housewives, were, they were disgusted with black dots which uh, to me sounded odd because in the Caribbean, if you're looking for good quality bananas, you look for bananas that have a few black spots. They give you the sense they're ripening, they're probably nice and sweet. But for some reason, the British housewife were telling us they don't like bananas with black spots. So our challenge in the Caribbean, and by the way, bananas was a major source of uh, employment for large numbers of people in the Eastern Caribbean. Um, but here now, the market for our bananas was being threatened by what the British housewife was seeing as poor quality bananas. So the British government gave the Caribbean and gave the University of the West Indies some funds to do research on growing better quality bananas. And then the guy who was uh, responsible for agricultural extension at the University of the West Indies, who was responsible for training all the extension officers in the Eastern Caribbean, he decided, and he was smart enough to think this way, that he wanted a communication person to lead a project which would convert the thinking of banana growers in four islands, convert their thinking into adopting new methods for growing quality bananas. And what were these new methods? Well, they had a research plant uh, operation in one of the islands, St. Lucia, and they came up with 21 ways we can grow better bananas in the Caribbean so that when the bananas are boxed, shipped to London, are opened in the London supermarket, they are wonderful yellow color, no black spots. And my job with four other uh, colleagues were to go around and talk to banana growers in each of the four islands to get them to adopt these 21 practices. 
Now, remember, I haven't grown anything in my life. I've never grown bananas, but I learned very quickly what these 21 steps are. How deep to dig the hole, what sort of suck up plant to put into the hole, how much fertilizer to use, how much pesticide to use, when to put the blue sleeve like a condom on the bananas to protect them from mosquitoes which bite them. You don't see the spots at that point, but when they ripen, you do see the black spots. Uh, when to cut the bananas, when to, how to box them, how to carefully ship them to what we call the boxing plant, and the list went on. And we went around talking to banana growers. There was one moment in my life doing this work when I ran into a banana grower and had to sell the banana grower on these 21 methods. And this one incident really grabbed my attention with a principle that I've never forgotten and that it is the foundation of the combi work we do. This was in the island of Dominica. And I had to meet this banana grower at the end of the day, end of his working day, close to sunset. Um, we arranged to meet him in his particular rural district. We drove down to the district. Then we realized there is no road to where the banana grower had his farms. You had to cross a river, which was filled with large boulders and rocks uh, in order to get to the banana grower. Um, but when we got to the spot, we saw him on the other side of the river and he waved and uh, he basically shouted, don't try to cross the river because it was pretty high at that point and, and we thought my frail body would not survive the crossing. So we arranged to meet in the middle of the river on a big massive rock. And I remember this scene very well because it was, you know, the sun is setting, I'm meeting this banana grower, I'm going to sell him on the 21 steps at a wonderful time in the evening. I hopped over a few rocks, got to the big rock that he wanted me to meet on. He came over, we sat down, I introduced myself, I told him what I was doing and that I was here to talk to him about banana cultivation and how to grow better bananas. And of course I did the natural thing, pulled out an information sheet for my little briefcase and I said I'd like to present this to you, here are the 21 steps that we would like to talk to you about. He took it in his hand, but he said, sir, you know, I can't read. So I said, ah, all right, let me go over it anyhow, and take it with you, and maybe when you go back to your village, somebody would be able to read it, and, would, um, and you can have this as a remembrance of our conversation. So I went over the 21 steps. Uh, you know, how much fertilizer to use, what kind of bananas to plant, when to put on the blue uh, sleeves on the bananas, when to prune them, I went through the list, I explained every step very carefully to him. At the end of that presentation, he then turned to me with a question which I should have prepared for, but unfortunately I wasn't prepared for. He turned to me and he said, thank you sir for this wonderful explanation of the things you'd like me to do. But tell me, why do you want me to do this? And all of a sudden, I was stumped. Yeah? I thought it would be enough to explain to him, these are the new methods that came out of the research plant where they were practicing these methods and had the evidence that these things work. And I said, well, that should be enough. But this guy was looking at me, wanting an explanation, a further explanation as to why he should invest his time and effort and money into following these 21 steps. And I said to him, well, you know, if you did this, you'll get four cents more per pound for your bananas. And that was quite a lot of money for the amount of bananas he can produce every week. Four cents adds up. And he said, oh, that's interesting, four cents more, yeah. And then he turned and said, oh, what would I do with the four cents more? I said, I, yeah, you know, uh, yeah, perhaps you could paint your house. I started coming up with all kinds of crazy ideas as to what he could do with the four cents. He said, my house is fine just as it is. I said, how about buying a bicycle? He looked around, he said, where do you want me to ride this bicycle? You came on that dirt road, you see what that was like? You can't ride a bicycle out here. God gave you feet, so you walk to your farm. I said, all right, uh, how about a pocket radio? I already have a pocket radio, thank you very much. Okay, how about using the money to buy a TV? A TV, we don't get reception out here. We are too far away from town, so a TV isn't gonna work. And then I was stuck. I couldn't come up with an explanation for the most fundamental question of why should the guy carry out these 21 behaviors? He then turned to me and said, sir, you know, thank you again for coming out to see me. But you know, let me tell you what I want to do. I want to get up in the morning. I want to eat the little breakfast my wife makes for me. 
Then I want to take my tools, my hoe, my cutlass. Yeah. I want to go to my field and I want to grow my bananas the same way I've been growing them for the past 20 years. Yeah. I want to come back home in the evening, stop by the rum shop, have a couple of drinks, go to my wife, eat the food she's cooked for me, go to bed, get up in the morning and do the same thing all over again. So thank you very much for your four cents more per pound, but no thanks. We shook hands and I walked away, hopped over some more rocks to the Jeep that was waiting for me. And along the way in the Jeep, I realized this guy has taught me one of the most fundamental lessons that has affected my career and that has shaped Combi. And the lesson is this. We may have wonderful, fantastic technical solutions for problems people face, especially in the area of health. They are fantastic, they are wonderfully superb in terms of their impact, in terms of their effect. But no matter how fantastic those technical solutions are, if we cannot connect those solutions to something that individual or consumer wants or need or desire, we can't sell it. In health, we have fantastic solutions to many problems. We have the mosquito net, we have hand washing, we have come in for the free TB test. Wonderful solutions, technically superb. But if we cannot connect those solutions to something that individual need, want or desire, we can't sell that individual on these fantastic technical solutions. That theme has woven itself through every combi plan that we have worked on. Whatever technical solution we are offering the individual, I like to use the word consumer, whatever that technical solution is, we cannot only talk about how wonderful the solution is, how superb the solution is, how effective the solution is. In addition, we do have to do all of that. In addition, and perhaps more vitally, we need to talk about how that solution connects to something that individual need, want, or desire. That's lesson number one from my work experience and came out of a failure to answer the most fundamental question we are always asked when we offer somebody a solution that will make a difference in their life. Why do you want me to do this? And I keep having to repeat to myself, remember, connect to the consumer. I usually point to my heart when I do that, but I realize I have a microphone here and if I hit it too hard, it affects your understanding of what I'm saying. Let me talk about lesson number two. I left the banana work. I went off to the University of the West Indies. I taught mass communication. I taught journalists how to cover the news better and all of that stuff. And then I left all of that, went back to the United States, and I ended up in New York City working with an organization some of you are familiar with called International Planned Parenthood Federation. IPPF was promoting family planning throughout the world, and my job in New York was to cover uh, the Caribbean and Latin America and to be responsible for what we call IEC, Information Education Communication. So my job with a team of people was to go through the Caribbean and go through Latin America and talk to people about why they should practice family planning, why they should use modern contraceptives. Now, one of the things you are already familiar with, I'm sure, is that Latin America and most of the Caribbean, they are primarily Roman Catholic countries, and in some cases, fervent Roman Catholic countries. Mexico, fervently Roman Catholic. Colombia, Colombia was one of those countries where every law that was passed up until a few years ago, every law that was passed had to be approved by the Vatican before it became law in Colombia. This was how fervent Roman Catholicism was uh, followed in, the, in, in Latin America. Now, you know the Roman Catholic Church position on modern contraceptives. It's a sin to use modern contraceptives. And here we were going, Catholic country after the other, telling people, no, 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 forget the church, right? And we basically would be saying, the Holy Father, what does the Holy Father know about bringing up six, eight children? Yeah. 
the Holy Father is not married, the Holy Father is not a father in the sense of having a family, doesn't know about the challenges of taking on a family of six or eight. Why are you going to listen to the Holy Father? Yeah? Ignore the Holy Father, ignore the Pope, follow us, use modern contraceptives. And then somebody said, well, what about the Archbishop? I said, what does the Archbishop know about bringing up a family of you know, half a dozen children and so on? And I'll go down the level. What does the village priest know, the parish priest? He's not married. He doesn't have a family. Forget the priest. Forget the Archbishop. Forget the Pope. Follow us. Practice modern contraceptives. In the process of doing that, we realize, well, the folks are very, very much attached to their parish priest. They're very, very much attached to their archbishop, and they would listen to the archbishop and to their parish priest. And of course, they're very, very attached to the Holy Father. So the question is, well, what are we going to do now? How do we present our case for modern contraceptives? In the process of this work, and of course, running up against this barrier of we love our parish priest, we love our archbishop, we love our Holy Father, we realize, and I particularly realize, again, this is the lesson number two, one of those fundamental lessons. And the lesson was this, if we cannot figure out how to deal with the opposition, we are not going to be able to sell what it is we are offering, in this particular case, modern contraceptives. When I look at the world of marketing now, and I look back at that experience, I realize in the marketing world, they also have that fundamental lesson. And the lesson that I picked up many years ago, working in family planning, I like to repeat it in the form of the marketing language that is used. And if I were to rephrase that lesson, it would be, always be mindful of the competitor. We call it the opposition in family planning days, but the opposition was really our competitor. We were making an offer of, hey, modern contraceptives, great for you, wonderful for you. The competitor was offering, no, modern contraceptives is a sin. You will go to hell. You might even be excommunicated. And if we couldn't deal with the opposition, if we couldn't deal with the competitor, which is believe in the Holy Catholic Church, follow the principles of the church. If we couldn't deal with that competition, there was no way to sell what we had to offer. So we had to be extremely mindful of the competitor, what the competitor was doing, what the competitor was saying, how they were saying it. And then we have to, had to go back and reflect, how can we counter what the competitor was offering? Because there was a certain period of time in Latin America where the competitor was clearly beating us out. But that experience of being mindful of the competitor enabled us to understand better the Catholic Church, the theology on which the opposition to family planning was founded, and to be able to help good Roman Catholics still remain good Roman Catholics, but accept modern contraceptives in their life. By the way, the theme that we hit upon by listening to the church and how they presented its theology, the theme we eventually hit upon is within the Catholic Church, there's a principle of in the final analysis, regardless of what everybody else is saying, your, your parish priest, your archbishop, your pope, in the final analysis, you have to live according to your conscience. And if your conscience were telling you that it was uh, not right, not the moral thing to do, to have eight children in your family and not be able to take care of them, if your conscience was telling you that you need to do something about it, and for you, modern contraceptives is the answer, then we say here we have something to offer you. But it is only by listening and understanding the competitor will we be able to find a way, a solution to offer the consumer. And again, I treat all individuals as consumers, offer them a way of countering the opposition or dealing with the competitor. So that lesson number two is also central, it's a foundational principle in our combi work. And I phrase it in terms of be mindful of the competitor always. Every time you make an offer of a behavior, there is a competitor. 
Now, I know a lot of colleagues in health say, well, what's the competitor? I ask you to wash your hands with soap and water uh, to prevent uh, you know, getting a vir virus. What's the competitor there? And I say there are many competitors, and one of the most profound competitors is do nothing. And by doing nothing, your, the competitor has won. What we now have to figure out is why is doing nothing better than what we are offering? And how do we then deal with that competitor? Another popular competitor, and I've run into this particularly with dealing with HIV and your risk of becoming infected tonight if you had sex in Swaziland, is the competitor of TAC. I wish I had somebody to write on here. I'll write T-A-C, TAC. And what TAC is, is take a chance. So the individual says we offer a condom, we offer fidelity, we offer abstinence. The individual says, nah, I prefer the competitor. The competitor is, I'll take a chance that tonight I'll have sex without a condom, with a new partner, and I'll take a chance that I'll, I will not become infected. That competitor, TAC, beats out our offer of the ABC, abstinence, be faithful, use a contraceptive, use a con not use a contraceptive, sorry, but use a condom. So I'd like to press on this particular theme as a theme that will come back within combi work where we ask our combi planners, always be mindful of the competitor because anytime you make me an offer for behavior, from hand washing to come for your free TB test, there's always going to be a competitor. Either do nothing, take a chance, go to the village traditional healer, you do something else and we need to figure out what is that something else and why that something else has appeal for the consumer, for the individual. Coming to the end of these three stories, let me move to the third and, and, and final dramatic episode in my professional life, which has given us um, this third principle. And some people, when, when I've related these stories, uh, tend to say, Errol, you know, you, you ought to have started with that one because that one seemed to be the most fundamental. Uh, but in the telling, I go in chronological order as to how these principles emerge in my professional work and from the failures of my, my early experience. Uh, eventually, I left family planning. I went off into the private sector. I began working with an uh, uh, advertising agency in New York City and a public relations firm connected to it. Uh, for the record, the advertising agency was Young and Rubicam, one of the big uh, top five advertising agencies in the world. The public relations company was Burson Marstella in New York City, which is also, they say, ranked as the number one public relations company in the world. They deal with some of the more popular products you would have heard of, uh, Viagra, for example, Coca-Cola, uh, some miserable products, Marlboro cigarettes, yes, Burson Marstella. Uh, does the public relations for them. Um, uh, Prozac, uh, another product that they've worked on. I didn't work on any of those. My job was to be their social development counselor. And basically what they wanted me to do was to go and speak to UN agencies, and in New York would be UNICEF, uh, the United Nations Population Fund. In Washington would be the Pan American Health Organization, part of the World Health Organization for uh, Latin America and the Caribbean and to try to persuade these agencies to use the techniques of the private sector, public relations and marketing communication, to achieve the goals that they have uh, in health and in social development. So my job is to make these connections and to persuade the, the UN system, the public sector system, to tap into the experience, uh, the rather successful experience of the private sector with marketing communication. Now, the first contract I was able to secure for Bursa Marstella and Young and Rubicam was in Venezuela. And this was with, uh, via the World Bank and with the Ministry of the Family in Venezuela. And here comes the third fundamental lesson in my, my professional life. The Minister of the Family, uh, through the World Bank uh, chief in Venezuela, uh, uh, heard of us and uh, what we were doing in terms of using marketing techniques in the social development world, asked us to come to Venezuela and I went off to Caracas and two other colleagues uh, had a wonderful breakfast with the minister of the family. The minister of the family, we didn't know exactly what he wanted us to do, uh, but he says, uh, first of all, I want you to know that I am a, a, a very fervent Roman Catholic. 
Uh, I'm a member of Opus Dei. I, I don't know if you know, but Opus Dei, this is a very powerful lay uh, organization within the Roman Catholic Church. Um, and uh, I am also the minister of the family, and I want to pull all of my interests together with a project that I'd like to, to give to you all. Uh, he said he had a quarter of a million dollars from the World Bank. And uh, as minister of the family, he had the authority to use that for something that's of relevance to the ministry. And he said he'd like to give us the quarter of a million dollars and have us develop and execute a public communication program that will get Venezuelan men to be more faithful to their wives. Here was a minister of the family offering us a quarter of a million dollars to promote sexual fidelity in Venezuela, in Latin America. Now, when I heard this offer from the minister, I coughed as I sipped my coffee, and I was about to ask him rhetorically, Mr. Minister, are you crazy? This is Venezuela. This is Latin America. This is where it is almost obligatory that a married man must have a mistress. And Mr. Minister, you want us to go and promote sexual fidelity in this environment. I didn't quite put it that way. I basically said to the minister, are you sure, Mr. Minister, you want to spend your World Bank money in this regard? He says, yes, we are a Roman Catholic country. We should follow the Roman Catholic principles. There is the seventh commandment, and we would like you to go out there and promote sexual fidelity. So we said to the minister, Mr. Minister, all right, let's take a pause here. We need to go out into the community and do what we always do when we are given any sort of communication project of this, uh, not of this kind, of any communication project. We have to go out there and we have to do what we call the market research. And uh, the market research really involved going out and chatting with men. So we'll go to baseball games, chat with the guys, make the proposition, the offer, what do you think about sexual fidelity? Do you think you could be faithful to your wife, et cetera, et cetera? Do you really need the mistress and so on? We got into very direct, very open, honest conversations with men. We go to bars where the men after work will come hang around. And what we find out is the pattern is you finish work, go to the bar with your friends, have some drinks, and if your mistress is there, have some drinks with your mistress, then you go off home with the mistress. Um, so we talked to the men there, away from the mistresses, if the mistresses were there, and again, we talked to them about sexual fidelity, how they felt about it, and the importance of the mistress and whatnot. Uh, we go to football games, do the same thing. Wherever we could find men uh, gathering, we would chat them up. And then we came back to our own office, had a little chat about what we found out, went to the minister, and we basically said to the minister, based on these conversations, Mr. Minister, let's put it this way, Mr. Minister, you have a product here that nobody wants. And Mr. Minister, in the marketing world, when you run into that kind of situation where you have a product that nobody wants, well, you don't go beat your head against the wall. You come up with something else, or you, you give up on this product that you want to sell. But the minister was adamant. He said, you guys say you could sell anything. I said, well, not quite, but he says, well, I want you to spend this quarter of a million dollars. I want you to make an attempt at promoting sexual fidelity. Get these men to be more faithful to their wives. So at that point, we're saying, well, a quarter of a million dollars, this might be an interesting case study. Let's see what else we can do. And we said to the minister, Mr. Minister, give us a few more days. We need to do something a little extra. What we did extra was, I think we figured out that in our first round of market research, it was incomplete. Incomplete in the following way. We didn't talk to all of those that we should have talked to. We didn't go and listen to the people we should have listened to. So once more, we said, let's expand this a little bit. So we went back, we went to the men, we listened to the men. We asked them a few other questions. And the kinds of questions we were asking, it was not so much about sexual fidelity, we started asking, so what do you think about your wife? My wife? Oh my God, I love my wife. Uh, she's God's gift to me. Don't touch my wife. Yeah? She is the dearest person in my life. 
And then they say, listen, if my mistress should tell me, dump my wife, that's the day I dump my mistress. I could always get another mistress. But my dear wife, the mother of my children, no, 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 no. She is precious to me. So here now, this guy wants the mistress, but his wife is very precious. What do you think about your children? How many children you have? We figured out three children. What do you think? Oh, I love my children. My children, oh, that's God's blessing to me. And then we thought we'd ask, well, how often do you see the kids? Well, that's a problem. You know, I work all day, have a few drinks and so forth. Uh, by the time I get home, the kids are asleep. You know, so I, I, I'm sort of sorry about that. Uh, we see them on the weekends, but yeah, during the week, that's, that's one of the tough things in life. I don't get to see my kids long enough, often enough. So, all right. So here we find out the guy loves his wife and he loves his children, but is sad that he doesn't see them. And the mistress, we talked about that. Yeah, we need the mistress, you know. We need to have that. Everybody else does, so let's have the mistress. So it's all right. And now we went to the family. And we were able to contact wives when their husbands were not around. Where we go there when the guys are drinking in the bar, so we're chatting with the, the, the wives. So you say to the wife, well, uh, what do you think about your husband? Oh, I love my husband. He is so dear to me. Yeah. Uh, does anything bother you about him? Uh, well, he comes home late. By the time he comes home, the kids are in bed. The food is cold. We don't get a chance to really chat. We don't have a family meal. That, that is sad. And then we got a little bowl that you think he has a mistress? Oh, yeah, 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 he has a mistress. Everybody, all those guys have mistresses. Does that bother you? Why should that bother me? That's been going on for hundreds of years. So, you know, I can't do anything about that. So he has a mistress. But I love my husband. He takes care of us. So the wife loves the husband, misses him. He's not home often enough. And about the mistress, she dismisses it as something she can't do anything about. So we keep that in mind. We talk to the children. Hello, kids, what do you think about Papa? Oh, Papa, we love Papa, you know. Do you see Papa often? Oh, no, we don't see Papa often enough. You know, he comes home late, and they repeat the same story by the time he comes home. We could feel him giving us a quick kiss at night, but, you know, we already sound asleep. We've already had dinner and so forth. All of a sudden, we're finding out everybody loves everybody here. Uh, but there were various gaps that were missing. For, so the husband, uh, you know, doesn't see his wife often enough, doesn't see the kids often enough, and that seems to affect him uh, uh, quite uh, strenuous, quite intensely. The kids miss their dad, the wife miss their, her husband, um, but they all think affectionately of, of each other. So we sat and we thought about this for a while, and then we came back to the minister and we said, Mr. Minister, we have a proposal to make to you, which is a little different from the one you originally offered to us. I know you would like us to promote sexual fidelity. But that's a topic, that's a product right now nobody's going to take on. But we'd like to propose that you sell something else. And the something else, we would like to call it family fidelity. And the minister said, what, what is family fidelity? So, Mr. Minister, and we described the stories we heard from people. Mr. Minister, what we need to promote is that families should stick together. What we'd like to promote is that three days out of the week for the husband, the father, three days out of the week, when he's finished working, he will not go to the bar. We'll ask him, go to your home and be with your family. The be with your family is the family fidelity. Be with the family, go home, play with the kids, read to them, have a family dinner, chat around the table, talk to your wife, be at home, be with the family. And the minister said, that is a possibility I could consider. So what we learned from that, we were able to tweak from an impossible product, which is sexual fidelity, tweak it to something that was probably more acceptable, that it was more acceptable to the minister, but we thought would be more acceptable to the husband, rather than talking about sexual fidelity, talk about why don't you go home three days out of the week and be with the family. And we started the campaign, and in fact, we were seeing results where people were deciding which three days of the week they were going to go home. 
one of the women in the minister's office says, well, you know, three days out of the week, they'll go home, they'll play with the kids, they'll have a beer at home, they'll have the wonderful dinner the wife has cooked. Um, uh, by the end of the evening, they'll be so tired, they won't even think about their mistress. So at least three days out of the week, you have sexual fidelity, um, uh, at least within the family. I said, well, that's not really what we are aiming for, but we want the man, the husband, to begin this practice of being with the family. Now, how did we arrive to that? And this is where the third lesson uh, 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 emerges from my, from my life. The, the way I phrase the third lesson is, is this way. Listen to the consumer. Now, again, if people don't like the word consumer, I say listen to the individual, listen to the family. But the heart of market research is listening to people and listening to the consumer. It's the only way we have found that could guide us into what and how we can sell something. It's by listening that we realize that number one, we can't sell sexual fidelity, but it's by listening to the family, to the husband, to the wife, to the children, we figured out we could sell something that we can call be faithful to the family, be with the family. And that was the third fundamental lesson from these three episodes in my life, each emerging from a little bit of failure and then a corrective measure. So if I were to summarize these three lessons, and as we talk about Combi later in this online course, you will see those three lessons are woven throughout the Combi planning process. Number one is connect to the consumer. We cannot only rely on the technical wonders of what we have to offer and their effectiveness. We need to connect to something they need, want, or desire. Secondly, we need to be always mindful of the competitor, the alternative, the do something else behavior, and figure out how to contend with that. Otherwise, that would always beat us out. And most fundamentally at the end, listen to the consumer, listen to people. And that's it for the moment. <laughs>